we're going to be looking at a follow-up to uh, what I spoke with to you about the last time I was here. Uh, we were talking about Western philosophy. Between that and now, we've also looked at some essential church history, which kind of fills the gap. I'm not actually going to take much of that time period um, that we looked at the church history in. I'm kind of going to skip, gloss over that quite quickly and move on to slightly more modern um, times. But um, let's just recap what we spoke about the last time we were here, that truth exists. It can be known. We meet truth in the person of Jesus, and truth is revealed through the inerrant Word of God. And if you want to know what inerrant means, that's one of the other sections in T3, and you have to do all the other modules to find out. But basically, it means it's not wrong. Um, now, as we said the last time we were together, our worldview is simply the lens of unquestioned beliefs through which we view everything. Two people can look at the same object, the same item. They could be looking at the same thing, but because they're looking from different positions, what they perceive is different from each other. And so what we're going to see today, and I'm going to attempt as much as possible to contrast the views of the world with Scripture and show where they've gone wrong and why we shouldn't believe much of what the world believes. But um, with this parallax that occurs, it's because they're just starting from a different place. They're stood in a different position to us. And so when they um, look, and when we look, it's because where they are. They're not going to see the same thing as us. And so we shouldn't be surprised when friends at work or, or neighbors, people we meet when we're studying or during work at times, um, when these people hold different views to us. That shouldn't surprise us, really. Um, it's just the way it is. So we're going to look at Western philosophy. Um, I'm actually going to quote Tracy here. I was asked, um, I was asked this question after some of the uh, church history sessions. Last night in T3, we went through church history, and I couldn't believe how horrific it all was. The pains inflicted on the world by the church towards heretics were just as awful as Caesar towards the early church. Can you help me understand why it's helpful to learn of such atrocities? I think that's a really valid question, an important question, and one which hopefully you'll understand the answer to by the end of talking, as we are going to tonight, about a whole bunch of more atrocities. Um, because the world is full of atrocities perpetrated by all kinds of atrocious people. Everyone is born atrocious. Some of us, by the grace of Jesus, are made righteous. But everyone's atrocious, and everything everyone does is atrocious. Jesus said there's no one is good, not one. So let's not kid ourselves that anyone's nice. No one's nice. No one's inherently good or going to do the right thing. They're all in it for themselves. But some, by the grace of God, find salvation and are made righteous, and hopefully they get it more right than others. But even those who find salvation and get saved, as we saw from church history, can make horrid mistakes um, that can bring a lot of pain to a lot of people. If we go back to Thales, when we started with philosophy, and we started right back in the beginning with the Greeks, we said, what was the essential question? And we talked about the one and the many. But there was this connection that they were seeking to find the connection between the one and the many. Now, we, we talked about how um, they were trying to find what is it that connects everything. And someone said it's water. Someone said it's air. Or someone said it's a, a spirion. It's this kind of disembodied essence. Um, but there is a connection between the one and the many. Each one of us is a one. And together we are many. And, and the impact that we see individuals having in history is huge. When you look like we saw, was it last week, with someone like Huss or Luther, the impact of an individual on history is huge. As we're going to see this week, the impact of an individual can also be huge in a very negative way. And we've got to understand that each of us has a responsibility to know the truth and to live the truth. You see, I don't want to sort of skip ahead in my notes here because there's a system to the way I've laid it out. But um, when we look at the individuals, 
It's not just the big name individuals, the ones who get quoted in history books. It's all the other individuals who were living at that time who didn't say no. They're equally responsible for what went down. And so for us, the reason we need to know history, the reason we need to know the history of the church and the history of the world is because it is our personal responsibility, no one else's, our personal responsibility to make sure that history does not repeat itself again. And when we see these atrocities, it is our responsibility to make sure they're not repeated. So that's, that's why we look at this stuff. Where we left off, the last time we were talking about philosophy, we'd kind of come through, and then, we, like I say, we had this period of church history, and we kind of got about as far as the Enlightenment. Now, the Enlightenment is the name given to it by the people who invented it. And that's why I've put it like this, enlightenment, because some would say it's not so enlightened. But how did we get there? Well, we had the Renaissance, which was kind of the 1400s onwards, and then there's the Reformation, which happened in the 1500s, and that moves us into the enlightenment. The Renaissance was when everyone dug out all the old history and all the old philosophy. And so they started looking at Plato, Aristotle, those guys again. The Reformation, Martin Luther told everyone, you don't need the church to talk to God, you can talk to him alone. What they heard was, you don't need the church. You know how it is, you know, the message always gets cut off halfway. So, um, so they just went, okay, we don't need the church. And so the essence of the Enlightenment era was we've got rid of God, we've got rid of the church, and now we're going to be man. Man is at the center, and we'll see a bit more about that later. Um, remembering that history is always written by the winners. And so the people who called their own era the Enlightenment began to refer to the previous age as the Dark Ages. They began to talk about the time when everyone got their knowledge and their wisdom from God and from the Bible. They began to refer to that period as the Dark Ages. And it's no longer, thankfully, called that. Most of the school books have been updated now, and it's referred to as the Middle Ages. But you can see where they were going with this. They were doing a darkness and light comparison, just like Scripture does, except they were doing it the other way around. Because the Scriptures tell us that God is light, and they said when we got rid of God, that was when we found the light. You can see how twisted they are. It's completely on its head. Instead of, they said, no, when we had God, it was dark. Now we've got rid of God, it is light. And they called their own era of glorious achievement the Enlightenment. And so this was the first time in, well, over a thousand years that political power um, and religion had been separated. Um, basically from the time uh, around 300 when the Romans had made Christianity the state religion, the Christian faith and power and politics in Europe all went hand in hand. And so for at least a thousand years, there had been this combination of power and politics and the church. And this was the first time, really, that power and politics disengaged from the church. In some ways, this was good because it meant like with the Reformation and with the Protestants who were moving out, some of them were able to break free from the corruption that comes with power, and they were able to actually pursue truth in a meaningful way. But inevitably, others still just used religion for their own ends um, in whatever they, way they wanted. But the truth was, because power and politics had moved away from religion, so did philosophy. The philosophy was no longer um, looking to religion as its plumb line, and therefore wasn't looking to the scriptures or to God. And so we arrive at uh, rationalism and a man. Um, Rene Descartes, who said, um, cogito ergo sum, or cogito ergo sum. No one knows how to pronounce Latin. If anyone thinks they do, they're wrong. Latin is a dead language. No one actually has spoken it, spoken it consistently from the Roman time. And so most people either opt to give it a kind of a, a Latin, a sort of an Italian kind of flavor, or they go with a kind of a French flavor, or they kind of try and make something up. But anyway, cogito ergo sum, cogito ergo sum. I think therefore I am. Basically, what this guy's thing was, he was trying to find a way of knowing without God. Now, if he had believed the scriptures, he'd have said, Fesit Deus ergo sum. God has made, and therefore I am. <laughs> because we know that we exist because God made us. 
But he didn't want to acknowledge God, and therefore he needed to find a way of finding himself without God placing a finger and saying, there you are, I made you. And so he says, well, what's the one thing that I know for sure? Well, the one thing I know for sure is I have thoughts. He said, so because I have thoughts, if I didn't exist, how could I think? Well, fair enough. But honestly, you're going way down the road here, uh, Mr. Descartes. You, you could just say, I know I'm here because I'm here. <laughs> but anyway, as is the nature of philosophers, he overthought everything. And so this was his thing. He said, I think, therefore, I am. He was very much into what we call rationalism. In other words, he wanted to reason everything. And so this emphasis on thought and thinking was very much in line with his core value of rationalizing everything. Rationalism, um, this idea that um, the foundation of everything is not what we can necessarily prove or what we can learn from observation. But if I can think it through, the conclusion I come to is the most reliable truth that I can have. Now, this idea is still very much alive today. Um, and we know from Scripture it's an erroneous idea. Uh, the fool uh, who says, you know, this is the way. Well, the Bible says there's a way that seems right to man, but in the end it leads to death. You know, it's quite possible to think something through logically and I'm sure all of us can think of examples in our own lives where we've thought something through logically, but God was saying something different. And so doing the will of God and thinking something out logically does not necessarily arrive us at the same destination every time because God's wisdom is far above our wisdom. And so we can't rely on just human thought to get us to the right place. But that was his idea. Essentially, this was all part of what we call the anthropocentric revolution. The idea that um, essentially man was placing himself at the middle. So the idea of the anthropocentric. Now, has anyone heard of the word anthropomorphic? Anthropomorphic. Um, some of you who have done uh, studied literature might know what that means. Um, anthropomorphic means that you make something into a human. And if you've read Beatrix Potter, um, then you'll know that Peter Rabbit is anthropomorphized in as much as he wears a little blue jacket and boots and he loses them in Mr. McGregor's garden. And so anthropomorphism is when you make something human. Now, anthropocentric is when you put the man in the middle. And so what Descartes and others, and, the, and basically the result of the Enlightenment, what was happening was they were putting man in the middle. They were saying man is the thing. Man is the center. God is no longer the center. He's no longer our benchmark for truth or for reality or for knowledge or for anything. Man is. Um, Immanuel Kant describes enlightenment like this. He says, enlightenment is man's release from his self-incurred tutelage. Tutelage is man's inability to make use of his understanding without direction from another. He's talking about a scholarly kind of situation there. Self-incurred is this tutelage when its cause lies not in a lack of reason, but in a lack of resolution and courage to use it without direction from another. And so basically what Immanuel Kant is saying is he's saying, that from the time of man existing, he's been afraid to use his mind without placing himself deliberately under a tutor. And in the immediate history that he's thinking of, the Dark Ages, so-called, he placed himself under the church and under this supposed God who was going to direct the affairs of his life. But what he's saying is that this this is because he hasn't got resolution or courage to go without God. This is, a, a, again, still a very common argument today. Yeah, well, you need that. It's a crutch. You need religion. You know, it's fine. You know, it's fine if you want religion just to get you through. You know, it's, it's not wrong. You know, you're getting on in years and everyone wants to know that they can enter the next life in peace. Of course, there is no next life and we don't believe in all that. But, you know, it keeps you happy and you know how people think. They talk this way. So um, this is the problem. 
Because this is totally ungodly thinking. Okay, so we, we've got it. We're working again. So we can, we can skip on to the anthropocentric revolution. We've got a man standing in the middle of a circle waving his arms and thinking he's very cool. Um, how about that? And he's throwing the Bible in the bin. Now, this is merely the stage on which the actors play. This is not the, the philosophy. This is the stage on which the philosophy is built. And so the, uh, the real thing they're trying to get to is an age where they become dependent on science as opposed to biblical knowledge. And so we see the age of science. Now, what's interesting is the age of science is born in this moment when people are getting rid of God. And yet it's totally dependent on the fact that people believe in God. Um, C.S. Lewis said that men became scientific because they expected law in nature. And they expected law in nature because they believed in a law giver. Now, it's not so simple as to think that every one of these scientists was actually a fully-fledged Christian like we would imagine a Christian to be, you know, tongue-talking, spirit-filled, Holy Ghost-powered, um, Bible-believing or bashing Christian. Um, no, not necessarily, but as Francis Schaeffer says, not all the scientists were individually consistent Christians. Many were, but all of them were living within the thought forms brought forth by Christianity. In this setting, man's creative stirrings had a base from which to continue and develop. And so this is really key. Basically, what had happened, this so-called dark ages that everyone despised had been a foundation of truth where people said, no, there is creation, there is order, there is design. And that was so ingrained in people's thinking that it led them to explore it. And so because they believed they would find a reasonable explanation for something, they pursued finding it. If they had thought that everything was random, well, what would be the point of exploring that? There'd be no point in trying to find the meaning in the meaningless. But because they knew there was order and they knew there was reason and they knew there was design, that was what gave birth to the scientific age. And so most of the scientists who brought most of the big, and I've mentioned many of them in the notes, um, either had a, a strong belief, at least in a creator God, some kind of personal creator God, and some of them were actually very Christian men. Um, some even like elders in their churches and that sort of thing. And these were the big scientists of the day. But science, because of its moving away from the Bible, also made some horrendous mistakes. And one of the big mistakes is scientific racism. The Bible is very clear about race. It says God made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth. In other words, the Bible is clear that Adam and Adam through Noah is the father of all the living and Eve was so called, the Bible specifically says, because she's the mother of all living. And so Eve, through Mrs. Noah, is the mother of all living. Obviously, I say through Noah and through Mrs. Noah because they were the sole parents on the ark. And so their children and their in-laws, their, their daughter-in-laws were on the ark with them. But essentially, you know, at the ark, we find a bottleneck where although Adam had had many offspring, it's all reduced down to Noah and his wife again. And so once again, we have a reboot at that time. But the Bible is very clear that we're all from one. So regardless of the color of our skin or our facial features or our body uh, shapes and sizes and obviously different cultures around the world, different ethnicities, you see different characteristics emerging. And we covered that when we talked about creation. Um, so I won't go into that now. We understand that we all came from Adam. Once you reject that, you don't have that foundation of belief to say, well, we all come from the same place. Then you start to question it. And that's exactly what happened. Guys like Voltaire, who was part of the Enlightenment, saying, no, I don't think these people all came from the same place. He got into a thing called polygene theory, which was basically the different races all evolved, essentially, individually. So like a Chinese person and a black person and a, a, a European person, had all evolved whatever that meant to him, because Darwin hadn't yet thrown his lot in, had all evolved independently. In fact, there was never a moment when the Chinese person was connected in any way to the African person or the African to the European. 
Now, we know now that that's absolute rubbish from science. We always knew from Scripture that it was rubbish. But what this led to was scientific racism. And what I'm touching on here is really horrible. And so I hope you won't think these are views I hold. It's definitely not. But I am going to mention some of the views that were made. Voltaire, who's one of the shining lights of the Enlightenment, if we want to use that phrase, he said, it's a big question when he was talking about people of dark skin, if they are descendants of monkeys or if monkeys came from them. Now, I mean, that is weapons-grade racism right there. That's horrific. But this is one of the great three, free thinkers of the Enlightenment age. And he was not alone. This was very, very common. It's interesting that the French Declaration of the Rights of Men and Citizens says that men are born and remain free and equal in rights. The U.S. Declaration of Independence insists that all men are created equal and that they are endowed by the Creator with certain unalienable rights. But both America and France continue to use and trade slaves even after those declarations. And the simple reason was they didn't consider the slaves to actually be the kind of men that that was talking about. And so what they said was, oh, but that's fine, because they're not the same as us. They're different. It was a polygene theory. So they can basically excuse their treatment of different races by saying, but those races aren't the same as us. They're actually different. There was a guy in Australia who actually categorized in one of his books on the flora and fauna of Australia. Obviously, a new discovered land there, and they're writing up the books of flora and fauna. He categorized aborigines amongst some of the animals you might find in Australia. And that's documented. That's, that's the stuff that was going on. Now, why do I bring this up? Well, if people say that racism is the fault of religion, <laughs> they've been smoking something. <laughs> it was not caused by religion. The Bible has never been the cause for racism. Racism is very much a product of people rejecting the Scriptures, like the ones that say he made every person come from the one person. The one and the many is found in Adam and all the men of earth. But in one, all. And Paul picks this up. He says, not just in the good, but also in the bad, that through one man, sin reigns. And so the one and the many is affected in that as well, in that relationship we have with our father, Adam. Um, Abraham Lincoln, the U.S. president, who actually ultimately freed the slaves, he although he freed the slaves, which was a political move, had nothing to do with his personal feelings about African Americans. He said this, he said, there is physical difference between the white and black races, which I believe will forever forbid the two races living together on terms of social and political equality. In the same statements which were made during the Lincoln-Douglas debates, he said that he didn't feel there was any grounds on which they should ever marry because they were clearly not meant to be the same. Now, this is absolutely ridiculous because from a biblical point of view, we're all cousins. I mean, like, we're so not different. From a medical point of view, if I need a new kidney, I have as much chance of finding one amongst my immediate family as I do finding them in a tribe in New Guinea. Because it's just about whether it's going to be compatible in terms of blood groups and other things. There's as much, literally, medically, there is as much chance of me finding a donor match in the jungles of New Guinea as there is finding one in my own family. So this is not something that Scripture endorses. This is views that came about because of the so-called Enlightenment, which was the true Dark Ages, the moment when they switched off the light. They got his light, they switched off the light, and this led to this. Obviously, then Charles Darwin does throw in his lot. He starts to get involved and say things. Darwin, he was an English naturalist whose faulty science led to interpret uh, natural selection as a mechanism for so-called evolution. Natural selection is not a mechanism for evolution. The survival of the fittest does not explain the arrival of the fittest. And that was a mistake he made. He, he thought that would. That mistake was perpetuated by his followers. And there were many people who followed him in that. Even today, we're seeing the effects of this. Just recently, uh, National Geographic um, brought out their new cover story, uh, Almost Human. They've dug up another set of bones, and they're telling us that this is our grandchildren, or grandfathers, rather. Um, interestingly, what also hit the news 
was that one of our own MPs, um, Dr. Machenga, I think that's, I don't know if I'm saying that right. Um, but anyway, he hit the news because he made this statement. This research is very suspect because it seems to be seeking to justify the racial ideology which says African people descended from baboons. Now, he got a lot of stick. The Twitter sphere exploded in criticism, saying, oh, you're talking from the dark ages. What on earth's going on? You know, oh, backward leaders in the nation don't even believe evolution. Meanwhile, he's probably more on the money than anyone else. Now, he's not arguing from a Christian viewpoint. His viewpoint is he is a traditional African spiritual person. He, he believes in the history of Africa. He has all kinds of books and things that he's catalogued from up as far as Egypt and down Zimbabwe and many of the ancient cultures, which are far more ancient than the cultures of Europe. Um, and he's documented these things. He has a creation story he believes in. He has a history of earth that he believes in. But the point is, although he's not coming from a Christian point of view, he has a point of view that was immediately shut down because people have a new religion, and it's called evolution. And that's mostly thanks to Mr. Darwin. The point is that actually what he's saying is correct. He may have been technically wrong about the baboon thing. I don't know that anyone ever said the African people came from baboons. But as we saw in our Voltaire quote, he wasn't entirely sure whether baboons didn't come from African people. And that is there. It's in history. We see it. These are actually the thoughts. And there is, there is a consistency to what he's highlighting. There is a consistency within evolutionary thinking that is incredibly racist. We see it not just, and there's loads of stuff in your notes, which I'm not able to include tonight, um, looking at the human zoos that were happening, where they would literally bring people from all over the empires and populate zoos with people from different places on Earth and hold them as zoo exhibits. Um, there was a guy, um, Madison Grant, who was initiator of the racial hygiene movement. Um, he had a guy called Otabenga in his zoo. Um, this guy was from the Belgian Congo. He was a normal guy from the Belgian Congo. Pygmy, so only 100 and, um, well, meter 50 full grown, but still normal. I mean, just a guy. He'd been married twice. His one wife was kidnapped and his other wife died of snake bite. He came to America. He was housed in the monkey house at the Bronx Zoo, which Madison Grant had founded. And eventually went mad because, I mean, wouldn't you? I mean, if you were housed in a monkey house and your only friend was an orangutan and a parrot, you'd also go barking. And eventually he was let out and he committed suicide, which was tragic. But this man, Madison Grant, who had perpetrated these crimes, he wrote a book called The Passing of the Great Race. Now, building on the work of Darwin, this guy, Madison Grant, he writes this book called The Passing of the Great Race. He bemoans the watering down of European bloodlines, particularly the Northern European bloodlines, the Aryans, saying how it's tragic they're being mixed up with all these other not-so-advanced species. A gentleman in Germany gets hold of the book, starts reading it. We know him better as Adolf Hitler. As leader of the Nazi party in Germany, he reads this book, and it gives him the perfect um, modus operandi for his system of Aryan perfection that he's trying to develop. He says, well, this is, this is the science we need to support what we want to do. We want to create the master race. Well, now we know that it's scientifically acceptable, because essentially what's happening is there's undesirable people. Let's just shuffle them off. You know, if they've been selected for uh, death, elimination, then we're just speeding up the natural course of events. And so that led to, obviously, horrific tragedies in Europe. Not just the Jews. Obviously, we always hear about the Jews. Um, and there were many Jews who were killed. But also, loads of gypsies were rounded up and killed. Um, people of other ethnicities as well rounded up and killed, plus also the physically impaired. So people with disabilities, physical disabilities and mental disabilities, all of these were rounded up and killed as well. Basically, it was a massive, what they call a, like a racial hygiene movement or an ethnic cleansing, uh, which is a, a phrase that was used 
first in the Bosnian War of 92-93. But um, essentially, it was a killing program. At the same time, they had their own breeding program where SS officers and their wives would be given additional support and benefits for breeding children. Plus, even if you weren't married, you could have kids on this program if you were proper Aryan, real good. Like if you were tall, strong, good-looking, beautiful, they'd get these guys and get girls together and they would breed them. Basically, the idea was to breed loads of really great Aryans. Um, and you say, well, this is weird. How did this happen? How is it possible? It's not like it was happening somewhere where there was no education system or where people were ignorant. This was happening in Germany, one of the most advanced countries in Europe. How is it possible? Well, again, it comes down to the one and the many. There was this one guy, Hitler, but there was also the many. What were the many doing? Well, the many, what was happening with them is summed up great in um, Martin Niemöller's um, poem, which you may have heard. He says, first they came for the communists, and I did not speak out because I was not a communist. Then they came for the trade unionists, and I did not speak out because I was not a trade unionist. Then they came for the Jews, and I did not speak out because I was not a Jew. Then they came for me, and there was no one left to speak for me. And when we think about that, we think about our own country, our own situation, where increasingly there's pressure on religious groups and on people of faith. We see, actually, our voice is so important. The voice of the one is as important as the voice of any other one. And so some of the things that have been happening amongst ourselves and, and, and organizations like 4SA, those kind of things, they're so essential to get a voice out there that says, no, wait, there's, there's a whole bunch of people here. There's the many here. But if we don't have at least one voice, we won't be heard. And before you know it, Germany could be happening all over again. And that isn't something we want to see. You see, the Bible talks about a time when people will gather together. People who will tell them exactly what their ears want to hear. The Bible talks about itching ears. This was what was happening during the Enlightenment. People didn't want to believe in God, so they found ways not to. People didn't want to obey the church, so they found ways not to. People wanted to be racist, so they found ways to excuse being racist. People wanted to get rid of undesirables, so they found plausible reasons to get rid of undesirables. At the end of the day, they just gathered whatever they wanted to. Um, in, in, in essence, there was probably an Epicurean root to all of this, that if we could just be happy, then the world would be good. Unfortunately, we can never be happy with all these people in the way. Let's get rid of them, and then we can make ourselves happy. Epicureanism, big part of the Enlightenment. And gentleman uh, Thomas Jefferson, who was also one of the presidents of the United States, he was in France during the time of the Revolution. He was greatly influenced by the Enlightenment thinkers. Um, he was a self declared, self-confessed Epicurean. And he was the one who enshrined the pursuit of happiness in the United States Declaration of Independence. He was the one who put it there. He said, no, this is, this is one of the things we need to hold as a value, the pursuit of happiness. Where in the Bible is the pursuit of happiness? Nowhere. Thank you, Tracy. In the Bible, there is not... The pursuit is not one of the values. It's not one of the core values of the church. It's not one of the things we're told to pursue. It says pursue righteousness, to seek first the kingdom. It says eagerly desire spiritual gifts, especially that you may prophesy. Nowhere does it say pursue happiness that you may live thereby. <laughs> I can make it sound like the Bible if I make it churched up enough, but it's not the Bible. It's arbitrary. It's subjective. It's one of those things, you're either happy or you're not. But how can I know if you're going to be happy? You know, I can get a sort of, I mean, I, I came home the other day from the shops with chocolate. So Pick and Pay had a special on Lint chocolate. Lint chocolate, some great chocolate. I'm not paid to say that, I'm sorry. But I'm saying it anyway. Um, <laughs> Lint chocolate, good chocolate. Now, um, they had a special on it. It was normally like 37 bucks. It was like 25 bucks. That's like awesome. So I bought the chocolate that I thought I remembered my wife and I really enjoyed. Turns out only I enjoy that chocolate. 
You see, <laughs> happiness is arbitrary, it's subjective. It's open to feelings and changed feelings. So I've really been enjoying that chocolate. Um, but that's the way it is with happiness, isn't it? Happiness um, is different things for different people. We'll look at some of that later on as well, the relativism that comes in there. Or all these guys, they're pushing away. They just want to find the system that works. Another man moving into the more of the modern philosophers, another man who tried to make things work was Karl Marx. Marxism, um, he also called himself a socialist. It's interesting that Hitler called himself a socialist and Marx called himself a, a socialist. And, and on, on the surface, that you'd think that they're going to be the same. And of course, it's, it's radically different. And yet, in its outworking, not so very different. If you want to know about Marxism, you can read about it in your notes. But what I want to point out is the fact that there's this thing called horseshoe theory, where the further left you go and the further right you go, you end up at the same place. And this is interesting because the outworking of Hitler's regime and the outworking of Stalin's Russia is the same. Mass genocide, destruction of intellectuals, um, the, the basic destruction of anyone who stood in the way of so-called progress, anyone who got in the way of the government was killed. Exactly the same um, way, method of working in both those situations, yet they would say they're opposites on the political scale. But there is no such thing as opposite on the political scale. It's kind of more like a circle or a horseshoe. You know, they never quite join, but actually those who are at the extremities of the political spectrum are actually closer to each other than they are to the center. And that's, 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 the, that's the thing with politics. At the end of the day, now people will argue, no, 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 I'm very different. I believe very different. No, 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 you, you think you believe different, but you're a fool if you think you're different. Because the only person who isn't a fool is someone who believes in God. The Bible says, the fool has said in his heart there is no God. So if you think that you can be extreme, when the Bible said the qualification of an elder is that he's temperate, <laughs> then you, you aren't fit to lead anything if you're extreme. That doesn't mean you won't make extreme statements from time to time, or you won't be very bold or very courageous that kind of extreme is good. But political extremes, very dangerous. And we see that in history. You see, what we see in history is that Marxism has failed time and time and time again. All the great Marxist powers of the 80s and 90s crumbled. And so the Cold War that had us all shaking in our boots, you know, the Cuban Missile Crisis, all that stuff, it all just went away because they couldn't keep it up. What we're now living in is the moment where the other side of that same thing are also fading away. We're having economic meltdown because it's unsustainable, because the political ideas on both ends of the spectrum, pushed to their very furthest degree, are unsustainable. And the politics and the economics, they go hand in hand the way they work out. And so what we have to see is we have to find what is that thing that God pulls us to? What's missing from Marxism? What's missing from rampant capitalism? Love, compassion, kindness, all the gifts of the Spirit. That's what's missing. You see, I could force everyone to share, but that's not love. Socialism, communism, I force everyone to share everything they have. Or I can say, it's every man for himself. Well, that's equally unfair. Because some people can never help themselves. What the Bible teaches us is compassion, kindness. The Bible teaches us values which will work in any system we find ourselves in. So if you live in a communist country, you can be a successful Christian who shares love and has compassion and, and shares what they have, not just because they must, but because they want to. If you're a Christian and you believe the Bible, you can live in a capitalist country where there's extremes in the other way, where it's every man for himself, but you can still be generous and give out of your wealth. It's been said that money is like manure. You stick it in a pile and it stinks, you spread it around, it does a lot of good. There's a lot of capitalists who could do with learning that 
And it's wonderful when you see a Christian making money. Remembering it's God who gives the power to create wealth. It's wonderful when you see a Christian making money, but not hoarding. Not accumulating for their own self, but being generous. Not just towards other Christians, but also generous towards God. That's the one whom God says, you've been generous to me, I will be generous to you. And so what we have to look at, when we look at these things, and obviously it's very broad strokes we're dealing with this evening. I'm not going to go into the nitty gritty of why Marxism may or may, may not work. Like I say, it's sustainable in the short term. Any system is sustainable in the short term. But um, essentially it all breaks down. Which brings us through to the last thing we're going to hit on in, in this half of the evening, which is existentialism. Um, which is kind of like, how do we, how do we, how do we describe this? Uh, someone said selfishness, existentialism. Um, well, let's look at a person first. Let's look at um, Nietzsche. He said, God is dead. That's a pretty big claim from someone made by God. Uh, it's, it's a huge presumption, really, isn't it? Like, so, my maker is dead. How do you know that? Well, I haven't heard from him lately. Were you talking to him? No. Okay. Um, next. Um, you see, <laughs> he had this whole story worked out where there used to be a pantheon, and then the Hebrew God stood up and said, no, you should have no other gods by, before me. And so all the other gods started laughing themselves so hard they laughed to death, just like in Mary Poppins. I think Mary Poppins probably took it from him, though. That came after Nietzsche. Um, so <laughs> just uh, that whole thing. And so, so then God is left as the only God. The God of the Hebrews is left as the only God. But he's not the, the God he describes is not the God of the Bible. Um, and then because of this sickness, this debilitating, crippling sickness called pity that this God suffers from. He becomes weaker and weaker and more feeble and more feeble. What Nietzsche was looking for was what he described, I think, as an ubermensch, a superman. He wanted this super guy, this just overcomer, this victorious person. He wanted to be that guy. He couldn't be that guy. He spent the last years of his life in a mental institute this um, atheist who thought he was Jesus. How weird is that? Uh, his sister sold tickets to interested parties to come and view him in the mental institute, which was her exercising her right to freedom of expression, I guess, which was something he would have very much approved of if he'd had a sound mind and was able to think about it at the time. His idea of the Ubermensch, this idea that everything is about just what you can get out of life. If there's no God then there's no real meaning in life. We talk about nihilism, this idea that everything is meaningless, pointless. But maybe there is just this one thing that there is a point to. If I can get the most out of my moment here, well, then I achieved something. And so his Superman is not like the Superman in the comics who's all about the American dream and liberty and justice. No, his Ubermensch, his, his Superman Rather, he is someone who will climb on the bodies of his opponents to get to where he needs to be. He's the ultimate conqueror, the ultimate warrior, um, and he just destroys all in his path, um, getting to where he wants to be. No personal morality, really. Um, just, this, just this powerful being. And a bit, essentially he said, well, that's, that's about all there is. There was him, there was various other guys. They were all in this, what was called existential sort of thought process. What are they thinking about? Well, they're just thinking about everything from the point of view of themselves and their own. Again, we talked about the anthropocentric revolution where putting man at the center. What they're talking about is everything from their own perspective, from their own view of things. The problem is when you're you, and you look at everything from your perspective, life is really depressing. Really depressing. I mean, like, you can't be you for very long without wanting to meet someone else. And I say that with the utmost respect. Um, the existential crisis has been summarized as essentially a problem of death, 
a false sense of freedom, isolation, and meaninglessness. Death is a problem because death is the final curtain, not the final frontier. Existentialists would never say that there was anything after death. He would say, anyone knows the end. And so, because death is inevitable, it's coming to us all, what's the point? False freedom is the idea that, well, because there's no one and nothing that created us or created boundaries for us, what are we meant to do? We think we're free, but actually we spend our whole life making rules for ourselves. It's a false sense of freedom. We have to create an environment in which to live, which is basically this whole idea that we're free is rubbish because we create this environment to live in and actually we create boundaries for ourselves and rules for ourselves. And, and so it's self-defeating. This idea of freedom is a false freedom. It's a lie and we're living a lie. And the idea of isolation, um, there was one of the Greek philosophers who had the idea that the hair could beat the tortoise, um, or, or the athlete could beat the tortoise, because every time he covered half the distance toward where the tortoise already was, the tortoise would have moved further again. And so it didn't matter how many times the athlete covered half the distance, it would never actually reach the tortoise, because every time he got closer, the tortoise had moved just a little bit more. It doesn't actually work practically. But it's this concept. It was an idea in philosophy. These guys... They talk about the isolation of the individual. It doesn't matter how close someone gets to you. They'll never actually reach you because you're always moving further away from others. There's always things that's coming between you and others. You're isolated. You're alone. You're desperate. You're depressed. That's the crisis. And the last thing is the meaninglessness of it all. Because even if you get it right, even if there was a right and you could get it, what would be the point? There's no point. There's no reward. There's nothing we're looking at here that's actually going to, you know, going to get a noddy badge or extra brownie points for doing this thing well, which is why Nietzsche says, well, then the only reason to even exist is to be the ubermensch, to be the superman who just kills and destroys and reaches the top. Now, this is obviously not the Christian view. (laughs) I thought it's worth mentioning. But what I do want to do is just in these closing minutes, just dissect these crisis points and just give us a scriptural reason as to why this is not the problem we face. This is the problem that most of the world is struggling with and wrestling with. And the people you're at work with, the people you meet in your street and, and at school, they are struggling with these issues because they don't have the foundation of Christian theology and doctrine that you have. So their struggle is real, and they genuinely feel these things. And it's not to say, no, that isn't true, because actually for them it is true. But when your foundation is Jesus, when your foundation is Jesus, things are different, genuinely different. And so if we look, first of all, at death, traditionally it's our enemy in Scripture. It's been overcome by Christ. We're told that death is swallowed up in victory. When the perishable puts on imperishable and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. That's 1 Corinthians 15. When we look at this idea of existential freedom, um, the idea that freedom is false, that there isn't really freedom because, you know, every time we think we're free, we create customs and traditions and educations and religions and things to build up around us because we're actually scared of being free. Well, actually, those things don't come from us. It's God who does those things. The Bible talks about how God institutes authority in Romans 13. He talks about how he gave boundaries even to the sea. And so when we look at the earth, when we look at creation, When we look at nations and when we look at individuals, we see that it is God. He marked out the foundations of the earth. He set boundaries for the waters, as in Proverbs 8. In Acts 17, it said he made from one nation, from one man every nation, having determined allotted periods and boundaries of their dwellings. In other words, the cultures of earth, the actual people groups, have already been given not just boundaries geographic, but boundaries of time by God. The boundaries exist because of God. They're not of our own creation. 
You saw me before I was born. Every day of my life was recorded in your book. Every moment was laid out before a single day had passed, Psalm 139. We know that God is the one who creates the boundaries and marks them out for us. Now, this is good because then within that framework, we have absolute freedom. If we're the ones busy tending the fences, then we don't have the freedom to run within the fence. But if God is the one who institutes the fences, then we just run free within it. We actually have freedom. Jesus said, it's for, it's, or the Bible says, it's for freedom that Christ set us free. No longer to be slaves. We were slaves to sin. We were slaves to death. We're no longer those people. We are actually free. This flies in the face of existential thinking. And then this idea of isolation. Isolation, well, God places the lonely in families. He's created a system by which no one should ever feel isolated. This system called the church, it's his glorious wisdom. It's what he's chosen to do. This is how he reveals how clever he is. He created the church. You think, well, it wasn't that clever. Have you seen it? No, no, that's what we've done to it. But the idea of church, the way the Bible talks about it, if we lived it the way the Bible describes it, there would be no one isolated. There'd be no one alone. No one all on there. I'm all alone. There's no one here beside me. You know, it's like, that's not going to be the case. People are going to feel included. They're going to feel that like they've been brought in. And so all of this, which normally would lead to meaninglessness, well, of course, there's absolute meaning in Christ Jesus. For we're his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. The life is not meaningless. Far from it. Before you were even made, he already planned beforehand good works for you to walk in. If you ever wonder what God has lined up for you, just ask. He's got a whole list. I sat with a couple the other day. We are chatting through some stuff. I was saying, no, they're trying to sort of get to grips with what they feel God's got for them next. I said, well, what are you doing now? They sort of looked at me. I said, well, what, what do you do now in the life of the church? The husband says, well, I do info desk like once a month. I said, and, and anything else? No, nothing else. I said, do you want me to tell you what God has for you? Everything. You're not doing anything. <laughs> do something. <laughs> God has everything. For, like there's, there's good works prepared beforehand. There's, there's a lot of stuff to be done. And there's not a lot of people doing it. There is everything for us to do. Life has a lot of meaning and purpose. We just need to grasp it, take hold of it. We're his workmanship created for good works. The existentialist looks at himself. He starts there, finds despair, leading only to death. A saint looks to God. Starting there, finds joy unspeakable and life everlasting. For us, just going into the break, we need to remember, truth exists. Truth can be known. We find it in the person of Jesus, and it's revealed through God's Word.